Before reaching there, they have to pass through various security controls. And they must, now it has been declared that in all these areas, people must carry identity card. Well, you ask a Kashmiri or a Naga or a Manipuri, they'll tell you, well, they have lived with this for last 30, 40, 50 years. So what is so new for us? But it is something new for us. In central India, in seven states, very soon, if you do not have an identity card, that could be considered a crime and you can be picked up. So you have embargo also, you have security forces. So everything is designed. I mean, what more do you want to establish that this is war we are talking about, not a police action where the police goes, tries to separate two writing groups from killing each other or intervene uh, to prevent a crime from taking place or to, it, to stop a mob from attacking someone like we saw in 1984 in, in Delhi uh, uh, when the uh, Congress mobs were killing the Sikhs, or we saw in Gujarat, where the army was, of course, they were deployed late, but the army, but these are short-term deployments. They are not prolonged. They are not for, for a, a, a long length of time. Or in all these 236 districts, uh, 235 districts, where the armed conflict is on, the deployment is for a longer period. It's not a short-term deployment where the magistrate has the power and the final authority to order opening of fire, things like that. In these areas, the security forces have the powers to decide on their own. When to carry out an operation, what to do in an operation, as and when they have to open fire and so on. And it's a brutal war. Wars are always brutal. We shouldn't expect it to be any different. And civil wars in particular. Because it's so difficult to distinguish as the army. I mean, one of the reasons why the army was hesitant is because he said, it's so difficult for us to distinguish between a Maoist and an Adivasi. So how will we manage? And then there are also Adivasis in the, in the army. We'll create a problem of discipline in the force. They are scared and they better be. But their being scared is not going to stop the government of India from deploying them as and when they feel it. Because if things are going bad, then they may put, bring them in. The point I'm trying to make is, the question we have to therefore come back to is, why this war? The Prime Minister had declared in January 2009 that the Maoists have modest capabilities. When you talk to the MHA people today or the... Uh, scribes who uh, operate as only an extension of the Ministry of Home Affairs. You talk to them and they'll tell you, well, Government of India believes that even if they have modest capabilities, it has to be nipped in the bud right now. Because if you allow them any more space, they'll continue to grow and expand. That's not true. Maoists have expanded when an offensive has been launched against them. Look at the history. In 1991, when the first Janjagran was launched in Chhattisgarh's Bastar area, what happened? The Maoists consolidated themselves. The second time around, when the Janjagran number two was launched in 1978-98, same thing happened. Third time, when Salva Judum was launched in 2005, what happened? Wars enable mouse. So, I mean, at one level, I mean, as, it's, as, as a joke, one can say that Mr. Chidambaram is actually a closet supporter of the Maoists because he's doing precisely what the Maoists want him to do, to wage a war. Because they know they stand the best chance of expanding and consolidating the position when it's a war. Because people are angry in that area. You have to go and visit to see it. And it's not just in those areas, in all the tribal areas, in all the peasant belts either over fighting over land rights, forests, or water. Look at the Ministry of Rural Development's report which came last year. The draft report, not the edited version, from which all the interesting portions were deleted. But look at the draft report. It's still available on the net. And I think it should become compulsory reading for all of us. Because it will give you an idea about what we have done or not done in the last 63 years. The title is Unfinished Task of Land Reform. Read it. 
and decide for yourself what an official document has to say about land reforms, about forest rights, about fifth schedule, about PESA, about variety of acts which were meant in our constitutional order of uh, scheme of things, meant to protect the tribals and the poor, how they have actually operated on the ground. <coughs> and why? People are getting fed up. I mean, do you expect people in Kalinganagar to believe in the word of government of India? Or do you want them to believe that their own experience suffices to convince them that without resisting POSCO and Tata, they'll get nowhere. And that unless they resist to believe in the goodwill and the good sense of government of India or the state authority will not get them what they want. This is the crown reality. They have not taken up arms. But the day is not very far when they'll feel that they have been left with no choice. I mean, if the police action can take place, go and demolish their houses, burn them, you're driving them, you're forcing them, you're compelling them to pick up arms. You're telling them that there is no other way. Either you surrender, give your land to the corporate that they are meant for, as far as the state government is concerned, and the police acts on their behalf, or, well, your choice is, devil in the deep blue sea. So either you pick up arms or you surrender. What do you expect people to do after 63 years? Really, what do you expect? What do we expect? We are middle class, we are well to do, we don't bother. It's not as if our food is going to be taken away from our table. It's not as if we'll be picked up tomorrow and, 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 and put behind bars. No, our freedoms are not going to be affected. Our food, our salaries, our cushy life is not going to be affected. But what about the 80% of the population which comprise this, this country? What are they supposed to do? What do we tell them? We tell them fight elections. Ridiculous. For 15 elections have been fought in this country. 15 parliaments have been constituted. Are we, are we to believe that people have voted in governments to keep them in poverty and are oppressed? And this is what has been the major contribution? If I were to say this, Mr. Chidambaram is going to get angry. Mr. Chidambaram says that Maoists call parliament a pigsty. But he's, Maoists are not the only ones who call it. A lot of us should start doing it also. Because really, what have we achieved in 63 years? If it's not as if the glass is half full or half filled. No, I'm sorry. It's a question of two-third empty. It's a glass which is two-third empty because 80% of the population are at the receiving end. And it's their fight. It's they are resisting in their own small ways, either through small struggles. It's not necessary that all the struggles are being organized or led by the Maoists. No, not at all. In Kalinganagar, it's Abhay Sahu who belongs to CPI. Jagat Singh. Uh, Jagat Singh Poor, it's, it's Abhay Sahu who belongs to CPI. But you see the anger of people everywhere. And look at the positions that the people of these parties who have, or their leaders who are connected with the grassroots, who know what is happening at the grassroots level, who know the anger.